Good morning, all. Um, it's it's a it's a great crowd. My gosh, you uh, there's a bunch of folks here, and I'm assuming it's probably the breakfast, not me. So I'm uh, I'm flattered nonetheless. Um, um, <clears throat> I've been in I've been in San Diego. Uh, actually, it's been since 1984, but. Um, I had the great pleasure of training under a gentleman named Gunnar Burkertz. Gunnar Burkertz is a, um, uh, he's, he just recently passed away at the age of 94. He was a protege of Aero Saarinen, uh, whose name you may know very well. Saarinen, of course, uh, probably the most notable issue is the St. Louis Arch was, was his design under a design competition and, and Dulles Airport was also his, uh, his design, all of which Gunnar was a part of. Um, that sort of uh, mimics the notion of a, of, a, of a bird, for lack of better terms. Um, I bring that up because <clears throat> my teaching at both undergrad and graduate school with Gunner had been about trying to think about architecture not as object. Um, I think w one of the things that, as an architect, uh, I, I struggle with uh, in, in some of the work that we do, we meaning the profession, is that there is a, there's a bit of a fantasia about the way things look in architecture. Um, I don't know that that's bad, but, but if looks are at the expense of experience, I don't think it's good. Um, and the teaching that Gunnar gave me was that things should come from a conceptual point of view. They should come from something that's actually authentic about the situation. So the idea of franchising a, a design and sending it 13 different places is not particularly appealing to me. Uh, I understand the reason why. Certainly the fast food industry does it. You know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, corporate in entities do it because it's a, it's a measure of convenience and it's also a brand strategy for them. But as it goes to sincere architecture, uh, for me, it's a struggle. Um, it's, it's not a place where I think real buildings should live. And so I'd like to distinguish the difference between building as object um, and objects as real architecture, because I think they're very, very different things. So I want to spend today, I know it was about, the, the topic was about revitalizing downtown and um, and I'll show you a lot of work that we've done in the downtown area, but I, I want to stress that it's not, today is not about my work so much as it's about how we think and what it is that generates an end game. Because most architects who are being very sincere about what they're doing on behalf of a client are digging for a reason to design something other than trend or the latest magazine clipping someone saw or the, the latest fashionable color. Uh, those things come and go. Great architecture, and I think you probably all of because of your interest, can name a building you love the most or two buildings you love the most in the world. And when you talk about what they mean to you, it has little to do with fashion. It has to do with how the building moved you, how the space may have uh, engaged you. Um, sure, it may have some fashionable items uh, associated with it, but it's really about a building having come from a place that feels genuine because all of you are genuine, right? Um, so when, when we do a project, it's the toughest part of a project, actually. By the way, doing a beautiful building is not hard to do. It's really not that difficult. There are beautiful materials, and we have ways of putting things together in beautiful ways. The question is, can you do it in such a way that it might create greater meaning that has a lasting capacity for all people to enjoy over time? That's a tougher, tougher thing. And I, and I would say to you that it's been very difficult for me to accomplish that, um, even to this day. I'm gonna show you a bunch of work. Um, the work will vary based upon what the client's capacity for accepting the concept I just talked to you about might be. Um, in some cases, they're fully open to this notion of a more uh, intellectual enterprise related to design. In some cases, they're not. Uh, and we are sometimes challenged by trying to push as far as we can to gain something meaningful out of the relationship we might have with a particular client. It's not their fault. Uh, it's our job in many ways to try to move them to a new place if we can do it. Uh, that's what we're, we're asked to do in the profession. So today, I'd like to just spend a little bit of time talking about um, 
some of the things that motivate us as a firm, and forgive me as I clatter some things around here, um, this is actually, I took this off of our web page. This is actually what you would see if you opened up our website. Um, and the term culture related to our name is really the capture for what I just talked to you about. It's this idea that, yeah, there are two guys with their names involved with a firm. That's pretty much irrelevant. The most important part of our name is that plus culture. And the plus culture issue is about our intention to search for something meaningful when we design a project. It's the culture of the client. It's the culture of the situation that we're looking for that we hope inspires an output that has uh, greater longevity. So uh, we start there. And what that means is there needs to be a method to, to, to our madness. And, it, and this search usually starts with, with a deep dive into condition. Uh, and condition comes from many points of view. Um, all of this, by the way, happens without benefit of drawing a line. It's really analysis. It's trying to figure out where am I related to this challenge, this opportunity that I've been asked to, to be a part of. And so it, ta it talks about finding opportunity or constraint or, or, or exposing possibilities by virtue of doing enough research on the particular program you're being asked to address. And from that emerges this notion of an understanding of a particular project's potential culture or its inspiration, for lack of better terms. Um, and it unveils the unique. Um, you know, we hear the word brand a lot in the, in, the, in the marketplace. And brand, to me, as best I can understand it, is what somebody owns that nobody else can own. In other words, if, if uh, we were all old enough to remember the, the Coca-Cola commercial that used to say, things go better with Coke. We all remember that tagline, right? And Coca-Cola's brand is so pervasive. It's an image, it's a feeling. Apple is the same way. You, when, you, when you hear Apple, you get a notion of almost a societal brand. It's not about a logo, it's not about that Apple you see. That's all part of it, but those are symptoms. It's not really the brand. The brand is an ethos that comes from Apple. Now you can like it or dislike it, but, but the idea is that Apple conveys a specific brand that we seem to be able to understand but not necessarily able to explain. That's what we're looking for in our quest for architectural solution if we can find it. And we don't always do a good job uh, in finding it, but we do the best we can. It really expresses the soul of a particular, a particular opportunity. That's really what we're after. And then there's this notion of making. In today's, <clears throat> in today's architectural world and in our office, we have the capacity because of software capacities, three-dimensional software capacities, and I'll show you some of these toward the end of the presentation, we can make anything. Um, we, we, I, I'm going to show you a veil that we made for a prayer chapel that's right out here at Point Loma Nazarene University that we just completed three weeks ago that was made from a 3D software um, uh, composition. And I'll, and I'll talk about the technology behind it. We printed it out in-house to see how it looked at scale, of course, but we printed it out because it was so complex, had we not broken it down into modules that had the ability to be spun, kind of like uh, carpet squares, when you see patterns, you typically carpet squares are made such that you can spin a carpet square any way you want and the patterns still go together. Well, this is the same sort of idea, except it's three-dimensional. And I'll show you what that means. So we're doing that sort of work three-dimensionally so that we can understand before we impose it on you, whether or not indeed it meets the litmus for the design idea that's trying to be conveyed. So making is a big part um, of where we are. And this is a library I designed in, um, in Virginia Beach. Um, it was a joint library uh, there that, that came from a very, specific, um, a very specific direction related to the site. And I, I, I hope I have graphics to show this to you, uh, but, but uh, we'll come back to that maybe here in a bit. So, so for us, <clears throat> these are the things we're really looking for when we do a project. We're looking to have drawn something that creates engagement. And engagement is you and I going to a place and having a feeling about it, experiencing something, not just looking at it. We hope it looks good. But again, I'll tell you, that's not that hard to do, is to make it look good. It's like going to the store and buying a beautiful set of clothes. I mean, we can all do that. And, and you can look just fine. The question is, what's in your soul? Right? What's behind the clothes that really matters? Architecture is no different from my point of view. 
Um, innovation, we hear a lot about innovation, it's an overused word, but, but in my mind, innovation is, is interpreting authenticity. In other words, it's, it's, it's trying to find that thing you believe is real and then innovating around that thing, not creating something abstract that has absolutely nothing to do with the condition you're in. Uh, that has an artistry to it, but it may not, from my point of view, it doesn't really serve the client well because we haven't solved the client problem. And moreover, we haven't created something that has a long-lasting impression um, on the world. Provocative, it's probably a, a, a little bit of a slipped word there, I suppose. But, but this notion of provocative means to me not, oh my gosh, or oh, that's beautiful. It's, it's simply evoking a real response by a user. Could be good, could be bad, by the way. Art can be good, can be bad, depends on the user, right? But the, the fact that nothing happens when you look at it ain't good, right? <laughs> Something should happen. And you hope, we always hope it's good, but we, don't, we never know. I mean, uh, the chapel I'm going to show you, I, my hands were sweaty the entire time it was being built, wondering, is it going to be worthy of the thought that went into it? Um, we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Uh, and then memorable. I think architecture that has meaning is something that you can actually explain to somebody later. In other words, you can leave. The St. Louis Arch is a great example of it, actually, right? You can explain that to somebody if they've never seen it. It's a very simple thing. It's a landmark. You can, talk, you can actually make the shape in your hand. You, you can explain the memory of a place that has power to you. To me, that's important. And one of the legacy parts of great architecture, I think, if you can pull it off. So. Um, just, just some, some thoughts. Um, we hear a lot about placemaking. I think it's kind of an overused word as well. Um, uh, hi, Mary. How are you? Um, uh, it's my friend over there. Um, um, but, but beyond guidelines, we, we are involved with a lot of urban situations. San Diego has a PDO, Plan District Ordinance. That's the guiding document for everything that happens downtown. I will tell you it's both a victory and a vice. Uh, people who believe that they can legislate design are nuts. Um, and what happens is the legislation of design is only as good as the author might have been or as trained as the author might have been. So if you go to a place like New York City, and I'm not trying to make a comparison between San Diego and New York City, I'm, I'm talking to the issue of urban, the urban aspects of, of New York City, which I think are fabulous. I was just there two weeks ago. I love the city because it's full of idiosyncrasy. And what makes, what makes a city vibrant is not unanimity or harmony, it's clash and idiosyncrasy and special things that happen as exceptions to other things. So when we homogenize a planning document such that everything has to be the same height, the same setback, the same street wall, the same uh, top, the same everything, there, it's almost impossible to create innovation around those guidelines. Now, what we do is we put them in place as protections against people who do really dumb things. But when you're trying to actually in, uh, exercise an, an intellectual approach to design, all of those rules tend to be in the way. Now, you still work with them because you have to. And so a lot of what you see in downtown San Diego uh, is a factor of what the PDO says architects can do. So you see different colors, you see different shapes, you see different textures, but the overall massing and form of downtown has a vast similarity block to block. And it's because of the PDO. It isn't because architects are choosing necessarily to do that. Now you can judge that as good or bad. I don't view it as necessarily a great thing. Uh, I think we have a beautiful city and I think as we work within those guidelines, we can make it, continue to make it a beautiful city. And I would tell you that urban placemaking, in my mind, is really about the first 75 feet anyway. If we can get it right at pedestrian level, up some 75 feet, which is really where our cone of vision is as a pedestrian, we're probably close. And what happens above that, in some ways, maybe not matter as much. Um, uh, so for us, it's this idea of gaining fine-grained texture this idea that there's actually not just concrete sidewalks, but there's texture in the concrete. Because what we love, we love, for example, how many of you would prefer to see a brick wall versus a concrete wall? 
All right? Brick? So, you, so, so the difference in those two things, as I view them, is texture. It's simple. It's the breakdown of scale. A brick is this big, and you put like 47,000 of them together, and you get a wall. But what we, what, we, what we really respond to is this idea of the tactile texture that a brick creates, for example. Uh, now, I'm not saying one is better than the other. That's not the point. But there is a, there is a sort of a, a human reaction to this idea of scalar detailing. Uh, brick is an example of it. Um, but as you get closer to where the human interacts, the texture wants to get more fine grain, if it can be, because that's where the pedestrian actually interacts with, with that particular facility. Um, honoring heritage, I call it insightful preservation, because I don't think honoring heritage is trying to replicate an old building in today's terms. I, I think that's actually kind of silly. Um, the idea, though, that you could take elements of history, respect what was there, understand you live in the present, but there's also a future look as a component of, of honoring heritage, I think are all good things in placemaking if, if you can pull them off. And then now, in today's world, we're not seeing any project that doesn't have some measure of mixed use uh, to it. Multiple uses inside one housing. Could be retail, could be office, could be hotel, could be residential. I'm going to show you one that has 10 different uses vertically stacked uh, that's going to happen in downtown San Diego. Um, um, the other thing that's happening now, believe it or not, is, is the entire issue of lift and, um, and, and what do they call them, the Uber. cars that don't have Uber, Uber Lyft, uh, what are the, the non-drivable cars? What are the, I'm sorry, self-driving cars, yeah, thank you, I don't know that language. Self-driving cars are changing the way we're looking at the, just the notion of parking. I will tell you, parking is the most financially cumbersome aspect of any project we do in an urban environment. Because if you think about it, you're building a big concrete vessel that houses cars. It's really just a storage facility for metal boxes. So the question is, as Uber and Lyft and all of these alternative transportation uh, opportunities occur, how might it actually shrink the size of a parking garage? One, things that, one of the things that's happening is parking garages now are being built with horizontal floors not with slope floors. It's always been easier for us to build a garage with slope floors because we both get the ramp to work and we get parking in the same event. Now, because we think parking is going to be reduced, the idea is what are we gonna do with all these slope floor facilities when we don't need parking anymore, right? So the idea is we're gonna flatten the floors and we're gonna create ramping which is eccentric to flat floors. If you go look at the port's new parking garage at the airport, you're going to see all those floors are flat. They built, I don't know how many cars it houses, it's huge. But what they did is they took this internal ramping system and pulled it eccentric so it serves into a box that has flat floors. The reason for that is that sometime that thing can become a usable facility for something else. Wow. Perfectly logical, right? What have we been thinking for so many years? But the cost of parking is the most expensive part of an urban project. That we're involved with. It costs somewhere between twenty and forty thousand dollars a space to build a parking garage in an urban center, depending on where you are. It could be more than that, depending on how you have to clad it. And the other issue of a parking garage, they're always at grade for obvious reasons or below grade. The challenge with that is that it's very difficult. Remember we talked about fine grain at ground level? Well, if parking is your ground level aspect, there ain't no energy going on there, right? So you've got to figure out how to create a layer around the entire street front area that creates human energy, which means the cars have to yield to another use that surrounds that parking vessel somehow, at least at ground level. So there are a bunch of challenges in urban work that we're, we're constantly looking at. Um, I'm going to take you through a few projects that are both a little older and, and, and some newer. Um, but it's not the project that, that I'm most interested in talking to you about. It's really what inspired the project, um, because that's actually more interesting to me, at least. Um, this is Bridgeworks. This is the Hilton uh, Gas Lamp Hotel. We did this for Esty Malkin. I don't remember when. It was a while back. Um, but, but it really came from, um, let me show you here. I got a little gizmo. This is actually the, the 
project right here. This is where the uh, uh, Hard Rock Hotel is for, to put you in place. This is the project right here. That's the Hilton Hotel. Uh, and this is a retail uh, building right beside it that was turned into a spa. But, but, but the bigger idea is that this actually came from just a very simple notion. Uh, the gas lamp is a historic district. There are 16 blocks in the district. Um, you, are captive, you, are, you are capped at 125 feet, I think it is. And, of course, densities are all described by the PDO we talked about, right? Um, but the idea here was, when we went back and did research on the site, this was actually um, the original landing for the Pacific Steamship Company. This, that actually was the waterfront where that building sits. And I thought, wow, what, a, what an interesting image it might be if you could sort of captivate the notion of a pier or a wharf as part of a project that was simply in memory of, it wasn't trying to replicate it, wasn't trying to be cute, wasn't trying to create history. It was just acknowledging what had been there uh, before. Um, and so the net result was a, a hotel project, a Fifth Avenue building at a lower scale. Again, this idea of street and scale, the idea was to get the lower building against the street and the upper building away from you so that again, as people, we felt more comfortable to approach it. This happened to be a, a bricky-ticky building because it's, it's warehousey and that was the attitude used here. I'm actually not a huge fan of using brick, but uh, it has its place and I thought it did here. Uh, and then you'll see in the middle of this thing, we call it pier walk. What we did is create a slot through here and actually sort of mimic the idea of a lookout pier um, in, in the building. And that's what this thing is that you see right here um, uh, in the project, as well as the notion of lighthouse. And then uh, Jennifer Luce, who's a good friend and uh, amazing artist, uh, helped us create uh, these, uh, these light fixtures that are between the two facilities. This is the Fifth Avenue side. That's the hotel side um, over here. Uh, and then the hotel on the park is the view that you see here, which is where its main entry is actually located. Some notion of of remembering the history of this place and telling the story of the Pacific Steamship Company in that slot is what, what occurred uh, as part of, the, part of the project's presentation. And then, of course, uh, ultimately, this became the gateway to the gas lamp from the south end uh, with the hard rock on the right and this, this project on the left. Um, um, uh, so we were also commissioned to do the, the, the hard rock hotel. Um, it, it's, a, it's a pretty good sized project, it's 430,000 feet, that's a lot of square footage. It's on 55,000 square feet of a 60,000 foot city block. Our blocks, by the way, are all downtown, about 200 by 300 is their general size. They're smaller than most cities. Um, I'm told that has to do with uh, 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 Mr. Horton's uh, 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 intention to try to create as much frontage as could be, be created. Smaller blocks means more frontage, right, because you've got more frontage streets, right, rather than larger. Horton. 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 Yes, that's, that's right. So, so, um, so this is the diagram for it, this idea that it, it is mixed use. Uh, it's an entertainment, I'm going to say it's a 20-something entertainment event. You've all been there, I'm sure, at one time or another. It's really loud. <laughs> it's really energetic. Um, there's a lot of booze flying around. Um, so the idea was to take, a, to, to take that energy and place it in a place which was safe, um, uh, and in some ways remove it from the actual street front so that it had a container of safety around it. So we moved it up onto the, to the roof, which is what this green area right here is, uh, right here. And this is, has a separate elevatoring that takes you just to this place. And when we opened this building, the uh, um, uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers were actually the, 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 the band that played their, their, their stage was here, and there were a thousand people on that deck. So it's a place where they can actually have uh, entertainment um, related to the quote Hard Rock Hotel. I mean, it's all about rock and roll as a theme and as a as a sort of an authentic uh, authentic place. Street life is key. Nobu has been there forever. They were intended to be. There was intended to be a signature restaurant on ground floor, as the diagram shows. And then the hotel bar was the preservation. Uh, of an original building that we thought we could incorporate into it in ways that had both new and old living together. That's that, that idea of, of preservation I talked about early where you're not, trying to, you're not trying to be historic, you're trying to be respectful of history and the heritage that it presents, but bring it into a new time uh, and let it live in today's, uh, today's terms. And here's the, the, the project as we see it 
um, today on the other side. A Form 15, we've done a lot of housing. There's a lot of housing going on. I will tell you, all of the housing going on is rental housing. None of it's for sale. And I don't know the dynamic, uh, I don't know for a fact what the dynamic is behind that, but I'm told that, that youth um, is, is more interested in, uh, and we have some of the youths here, I think, so that's good. Um, maybe you can tell us why you don't. Want um, but, uh, uh, but I'm told, and it makes sense, that, you know, that the recession taught a lot of people about what the economy was related to sinking a bunch of money into a home. And the idea that dispensable income can be used a lot of ways, um, having a car is really not of great interest to a lot of the millennials we're dealing with, and so this idea that I can be in a place, I can rent it, but I can have disposable income to do the things I want to do for daily life is really the way it's being interpreted now. Now, will that change? I don't know. We still do not have people coming into our office talking to us about building for sale housing. It, it is all rental housing, every project. And I, we've done in the last, I'm going to say last five years, we've done no less than 8,000 rental units of design uh, through that time. You had a question? Um, actually, interestingly enough, the answer is no. Um, well, I, I'll, let me back up and say it this way. It's, it might be a little unfair to say that. Uh, as the market changes, a lot of them will convert to sale. Well, here's what's happening. We have a client named Hanover. Hanover is one of the larger builders in the country. They're, they're great people. They're fantastic clients to work with. They do a great project. When we worked with them prior to the last recession, to your point, what's your name? Julie, to Julie's point, what happened prior to the recession is every project we did for them was done to condo spec. And they actually put a condo map on it with the notion that as they sold the project, the, the buyer could then convert. They have stopped that policy. Uh, now, that's not to say somebody couldn't convert them, but they're not doing it. And, and the reason they're not doing it is the liability associated with condo construction is so high for construction defect, um, uh, and the cost of that enterprise is so costly, both to developer, architects, and anybody else who breathes on the project, uh, they've just quit doing it because they don't want to deal with it. So that may change to, to, to your point. So these are, these are all uh, rental housing units. This one happens to be uh, 242 units. Um, uh, uh, right here in downtown, but the, I, I, the, bigger, the bigger issue here is to look at this diagram because the building, again, to me is less important. The, the idea when we started to look at this was to understand what's the seismic activity of downtown San Diego. And believe it or not, these seismic faults run all through downtown. So this green stuff you're seeing here isn't just a fancy uh, landscape diagram. It's actually a crack in the earth <laughs> that is, is known to be potentially active. And our job is to stay away from those fissures, as you might imagine, which means we have to keep a minimum of 25 feet away from them on either side. And they're precisely mapped, by the way, in seismology uh, maps that we use for these projects. So what you see right here in the middle um, is a project, this is the project, what you see is a project that has to yield to uh, that seismic activity. And from our point of view, that's just an opportunity. It's not really a constraint. I mean, because it means that what you're building is, is authentically responding to the reality of the earth that it's sitting on, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, and it can be interpreted a number of ways, of course. But you can see this area right here, is, it, the drawing is flipped, but this area right here, that's a fault running right through the property right there. So this distance is all about staying away from the center line of that fault, and what it does is it becomes a sort of an interesting shape, and it also becomes a form generator for amenity space, perhaps, because you can put pools and landscaping and hardscape out there, you just can't put buildings um, in, in the middle of that space. And then the idea is to simply serve into that space uh, from, adjacent, from adjacent uses, so these serve into here, this serves into here, and also brings light and air uh, to those units uh, through, the, through the project. And then just a quick image of the, of the project itself. Some of the interior aspects of the project. This project also, because it's, it's seated in East Village, um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of grit in East Village, meaning um, there's, a, there's a lot of fine green stuff laying around. You know what I mean? It's, 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 and so the idea was to bring the grit 
inside the building so that it wasn't an, an abstraction. It was something that you actually, you actually experienced. So it's, it's, the space is kind of raw. This is actually the seismic park right there uh, that's, that, that, that uh, runs, through, runs through the project. This is another project that was actually influenced by um, a seismic condition. This is two 22-story towers that was done for Reliance Development out of New York. Um, it's a big project, um, and, and it was really inspired by this section diagram to say, look, what we want to do, because we have to deal with parking, is we want to minimize the amount of parking below grade because that's the most expensive parking you can build. Uh, if you can imagine, you're, you're basically building a, a bathtub uh, because hydrostatic pressure, we're so close to the water that at certain, depending on what site you're on, you could be in the water table very quickly. So you're building a bathtub, the lower you go, the more hydrostatic pressure you have, obviously. So if you can keep it higher, it's less expensive. So in this case, we determined we were, we were gonna go down one level and then stack parking and then wrap uses around this where this was actually a garden deck that took you up and down from both sides. This being a retail street, this being actually the entry to the, to the tower sequence that occurs um, uh, on uh, Front Street. So this is right, just to put you in perspective, this is the Ralph's uh, grocery store right here, right directly adjacent uh, across the street. And so this was the manifestation of, of that building. This building yields right here because there's a fault line that runs right to this spot right there. So the building, instead of being on the street, actually moves back like this because the fault line runs this way and the street runs this way. So the idea is then, well, when you have those kinds of things occur, what, what can you do with them? Well, it seemed like a natural place to invite a sort of a grand stair to, to the upper deck up here, which is the, uh, the amenities for, for these particular uh, residential uh, units. Uh, 520 West Ash is under construction right now with Lennar uh, Development. They're another large... Uh, builder here in town, and we do a lot of, um, every architect does this, I believe, um, we do a lot of studies that don't relate to a building so much as they relate to a building's opportunity in the sky, and, and, and when you get vertical, you're worried about views, you're worried about sun angles, you're worried about reflection. Uh, by the way, anything near the ballpark in downtown San Diego has to have a glare study done on it um, to make sure there's no reflection of sun into the baseball player's uh, uh, eyes, right? Uh, you thought they just couldn't catch. That's not true. <laughs> There's, sometimes it's a reflection. Uh, uh, but, but these studies are done to, to sort of show what the opportunity is. And we're doing it for ourselves. We're also doing it for our clients. So all of these, all of these diagrams help us understand whether or not we think we've, we've manifest the great greatest opportunity that a particular site, again, a specific place, uh, provides uh, to a project. And this is the, uh, the project rendering. It's not done yet, so uh, we don't have any real uh, photos to show uh, of, that, of that facility yet. But, but the idea even here is that as you look at a building, one of the things that sort of drives me crazy as an architect is to see a building and you walk around the building and it is exactly the same on all four sides. I just cannot comprehend how you can see the sun do its trick from morning to night and not realize the different influence the sun has on the different facades of a building. It's not possible. And I will tell you, if you see a building with a sun shade on the north side, <laughs> something's wrong. <laughs> the sun don't shine from the north. It will never touch a north facade of a building. So why would you have a, so, a, a soleil over a window as a protection. It never touches the north side of a building, ever. So the idea, the idea is to try to tune a building to the way things actually work. And you don't always get it right, but if you tune it right, for example, I showed you the library the, at the very beginning from Virginia Beach, that building is all tuned to the solar array, how the sun hits it. So if it comes from a severe direction, for, from the south, for example, you might take sunlight and reflect it one time. Create a baffle, it hits the baffle, then shoots the light into a place because that baffle takes the heat away and takes the glare away. So it serves a couple purposes and of course it also creates shading just for, for the sake of being inside the building. So these buildings um, tend to want to have different 
uh, different uh, uh, views along the way. Um, this is a, a project that's just finishing up at 15th and Island um, here. Again, this building is in what I would call the grit of the city. And, and the, the, it's not so much, I mean, you can look at the shapes and all that stuff, but, and that is meant to, it is meant to say, you know, we're, we're sort of in the gritty part of the, we're in the kind of the idiosyncrasy place of downtown. But the bigger issue here is, is really what happens um, at the lowest level of this building, because I, I don't, may not have great renderings today to show you, but, but this, uh, there are a, a whole series of, of uh, columns that are shaped like this, that have uh, f uh, sort of gritty filigree uh, stuff in it, again, gr granular stuff that you walk with, you walk around, you interact with. It's all part of the retail base of the building. So the idea of that facade being broken down as it comes down to ground to where things feel, uh, this is architect stuff, there things feel like, if they feel like this, they don't feel like this. Right? You know what I mean? It's, it's like I can grab that stuff because I'm human. This stuff is slick and I, it doesn't really relate to me. That can happen higher in a building because we're not going to be able to touch the stuff up there for the most part or even there. But you can see as this thing comes down, it starts to break its scale down. Things become more, uh, more fine grain. Uh, you can see those columns right here actually along the street. And all of this is a retail experience down here uh, at, the, at, the, at the street level, as you might imagine. Um, these are some shots that a friend, it isn't done, so these are some shots that a friend took, but this is the, the, uh, the, the, the upper deck, the tallest uh, floor, which is a common space uh, where the pool and, and things are for the building. You know, you're up 245 feet in the air right here, so just to put a, a, a spin on it. And then even the idea of, you know, th thing, to be thoughtful just about a simple mailbox, uh, you know, rather than just a big pile of mailboxes and a wall, you can create grand, granular sort of notions of even it with a little color and a, and a cubby hole. One of the biggest issues, by the way, in, in apartment building now, uh, design now, I shouldn't say building, design now is this whole Amazon phenomena. Right? I mean, and, and I'm guilty of it at my office. I got a pile of stuff that comes every day. And I can't wait to go shop on Amazon Prime for stuff I don't need. <laughs> and they deliver it to the office. Well, if you multiply that by 580 people every day, what it means is we're now creating spaces that just house this stuff that gets delivered to these units. That didn't exist six years ago even, right? So it's a very different dynamic. Um, so when you, can, when you, when you consider that this parking phenomena, the cost of parking, because you don't have to build as much, being traded out for doing these other things, it can kind of make sense. The other thing I would tell you about apartments, unlike the apartments I went to when I was in college or, or uh, shortly thereafter, apartments now are large resort hotels for the most part. There is the, the, the spaces are getting smaller that you live in and the amenity spaces are getting larger. So you'll go to a chef's kitchen, you'll go to a, a cabana by the pool, you'll go to a movie theater. You'll, all of these things are part of the same space that used to be living space. But now, rather than leaving, like may, perhaps maybe in your home, you leave one room and you go into another room for entertainment. And essentially, the, the apartments are being designed now such that the living unit is where you sleep, let's call it, and perhaps eat. And anything else you want to do is really outside that demising wall. So it might be a common area of uh, lounge, or it might be a big TV room to watch sports, or it might be any, but it's common to um, a bunch of folks. And that's really the way these things are, are, are evolving um, now um, in the process. And I just like this shot, so i just do that. Um, that might be the best shot I'm going to show you today, by the way. So, um, And then, you know, there's also affordable housing. Affordable housing... Is, is critical and affordable housing is a kind of a, it's a tough word for me because I, I kind of don't get it. I mean, I, it, there are all kinds of affordable versions of housing. Um, it, a lot of it's related to the, to the average mean income of someone, 60%, 50%, 80%, whatever it is. And so they all get built for different audiences, frankly. Um, this, is a, this was done with um, affirmed housing, uh, a guy named Jim Silverwood, just a wonderful gentleman. Um, uh, and this is at, uh, at uh, uh, 15th and Imperial, 
downtown called Studio 15. And the idea here, by the way, was to say just because I'm an affordable housing project doesn't mean I can't have panache, that I can't have, I can't have my own version of idiosyncrasy, that I can't tell somebody, yeah, I live in the Mondrian-esque uh, 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 affordable housing project uh, downtown. And uh, so this project was really designed um, to, to express uh, uh, this notion of fine grain through color and, and interpretation of material overlap and things of that nature. Because what I see a lot of affordable housing looking like is it's just, it's, it's so pragmatic, it's almost not livable to me. It just doesn't feel interesting. Um, it's a little unfair because material cost is material cost. It kind of doesn't matter what color it is or what texture it is. It's cost about the same. <laughs> so why not make it interesting, right, if you can? Um, and, and so this project was about, was about a lot of color, which brought energy to the place. Um, and interestingly enough, this project, I'm gonna show you this, uh, go back just real quickly. This project actually uh, is interesting because this wall is a big light reflector. Um, that wall is facing south. And what this wall does is it, hits, it gets the sun from here and throws it into the space. You're constantly trying to figure out a way to use God's natural light in positive ways. And walls are reflectors. And they can be bright reflectors, medium reflectors, light reflectors, or in this case, no reflectors, right? Because it's black or it's dark, it's char charcoal. So every surface has the ability to do something for you besides just look a certain way if you use them right. In the case of the library we did in, in um, Virginia, we actually created a, it's, it's a shape like this that is made out of fabric and it runs the entire length of the circulation system. And what happens is there's a window here and the window allows direct harsh sunlight to hit this and because of its angle, Obviously, it reflects it down into the space. So the light comes in this way and is reflected 35 feet down to the ground floor of that building. This is a library, so direct light is never your friend. It has to be indirect. It has to be north light. Um, direct light and books don't get along. So you're trying to constantly figure out ways that you can use natural light beneficially, no matter where it's coming from. But you have to know, that's why a building can't look the same on four friggin' sides. Makes no sense. None. Uh, west is completely different than east. And north is completely different than south. Everywhere in the world, by the way. Not just here. So this idea that, that you can ignore it, I think, is, is irresponsible on architect's part. And I'm talk talking to me. So um, I think you, you, next time you see a building like that, especially if I did it, you call me. <laughs> And uh, you call me and chew me out. Um, this actually is happening right at Park and Market. And this is an amazing thing. These are old renderings, so forgive me. But this is a housing project. But the most important part of this project happens to be um, UCSD's move to downtown San Diego. This is UCSD extension. Mary Walshock, who many of you probably know, is just, she's, a, she's just a trooper. She's got more energy than probably most of us in this room. And she's a prolific author and uh, just a wonderful human being. She's bringing her downtown version of UCSD to this site at the corner of Park and Market Streets, which is, of course, very close to us, and it's under construction right now. It's a big hole in the ground right now. Um, the part of this that actually is UCSD's is this piece, which is a, that's a 60,000 square foot office building. Now, the interesting part of this, uh, by the way, this is, the, this is Park right here. Um, and 11th is on the other side of it, um, and, and this is Market. Um, the main entry to this building will be right here off of Market. This will be a cafe that serves out onto a, a widened uh, sidewalk on Park. Um, and the more important part of all this happens right back here, which I'm going to show you. These are apartments. So this is owned by, this is owned by Holland, and this is owned by UCSD. Uh, they're co-located co on the same, on the same, uh, same block. Uh, again, this is the east side of it, or west side of it. This is the office building. That's the apartment building. Um, and I'm not going to dwell on it, but this is really the more important piece of this. This is the Raman house right here. It's a historic house. We had this house picked up, moved off the site. They're reconstructing it. 
meaning it is going to be restored to the way it was when it was built. Uh, and the idea of this house is that it will be brought back to the site and really become one of those preservation heritage energy centers for what would otherwise be a bunch of new building on the site. So it's going to, it could be a brewery or a restaurant, it could be a retail center. I don't think the owners know exactly what it is yet, but there's space all around this thing which is outdoor space, which allows it to live isolated. So we didn't touch it. We didn't try to impose ourselves on it. We gave space around it at ground level, which allows other things to happen. And then all the space here, this is an amphitheater. This actually, those are steps and seats that run up to this upper deck level uh, here and around here. And that's actually a movie screen. So all of this, this whole area right here, now under this is, is retail down below here. But you come into the space, you can go up these amphitheater steps, and all of the energy of that retail use can be part of, see, I knew I was going to electrocute myself. It can be, can be part of uh, that, in, that urban energy. The other thing that happens is UCSD's building right here has big doors right here that open out onto this deck. So this thing can be completely integrated as, a, as an urban energy center for a site which is right directly across the street from here, actually. It's a kitty, kitty corner, right? A block away or so? Uh, very close. Uh, so here's some images of, of, of what this is about. And just this idea that there is a transparency about the ground floor experience for people. Um, the other thing that's, that's, that, that happened, or it happened in San Diego, there are one or two buildings in San Diego that still live in the world of reflective glass. And I will tell you, reflective glass in urban scenarios to me are, are great enemies. At least as it goes to that first 75 feet we talked about, that cone of experience or pedestrian vision or interface. These buildings downtown that have reflective glass that goes all the way to the ground. It's like the dumbest thing I ever heard, right? You, I mean, that's not, there's nothing human about that. I'm looking at a reflection of myself in a piece of glass, notwithstanding the negative impact it can have just based on solar moves, because that solar, uh, that solar reflection is imposing on surrounding buildings and streets and so forth. So it has great impact, this transparency. Here's the upper part of that deck. Uh, looking down, um, I'm not sure there'll be that many balloons there, but <laughs> but, uh, but 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 who knows, right? Um, uh, and then Ballpark Village is the project that is just now completing, uh, right next to Petco Park uh, downtown. Um, this is a big project. Um, Graystar is the developer of 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 this with GMI, John Moore's Investments, um, and. Uh, it was Lennar, it's not, Lennar is not involved anymore. But, um, but I, I, I'll just, one of the key parts of this, this was one big lump of cheese when we got it, meaning this is just a big site. And the idea of this was to reinvent the street grid so that the street grid, which did exist at one point, this is Tailgate Park right here, by the way. So the street grid that did exist uh, was non-existent on this, in this site. So the idea was to create not necessarily vehicular connections, but pedestrian connections. So, but the memory of, of access that you can still move through things, not around things. It's actually one of the, one of the imp imposing parts I thought of the idea of having a, a football stadium downtown, and I don't have any political view about it at all, except that that's a big lump of cheese. And you're not gonna walk through that cheese, you're gonna walk around it, always. So the question, is it the right place? Is it in the right place relative to our urban energy downtown. You just have to ask yourself the question, do you want to walk around a 600 foot long by 700 foot long street facade? And, and generally speaking, I think if you want to create connections, it's difficult to do. I don't, you know, I'm not trying to judge it so much. It's just, it's a fact. It's, you got to go around it. Um, so you have to kind of assess whether that's right. And we didn't feel it would be right to build a big lump of cheese right here that didn't have capacities for people to get through it. It didn't make any sense to us. So the idea then, because 10th Avenue actually has a little curly cue on it when it gets down to here, this is a park, curly cue, is to open a civic plaza space right here, which, which ends up being the focus of the end of 10th, 10th Avenue. 
Um, and that will be an entertainment uh, energy center, not, not, not vehicular, pedestrian. Um, and then these connections allow people to get to other places because ultimately these, this tailgate park will get developed somehow at some point. Um, it's just not happening right now. And so this is a sort of a view of, of how that, these are early renderings and frankly, uh, all the yellow stuff is gone, thank God. So um, uh, it's, if you go down there, you'll see, uh, you'll see how it uh, has manifested itself. But this idea that you can see through things as pedestrians, I think is really important. Not, not just the idea of reflective or transparent glass, but looking by things so that you're looking at vistas that take you someplace and you can understand where you're going um, as an axial exercise. That, that we think that's kind of important. These are some of the 3D renderings done uh, of that facility. Um, and there's that civic uh, plaza that occurs at the end of 10th Avenue right here. Um, and then all these bridges are above you so they connect the floors above, but they still allow you to pass at, at grade level um, through the facility. And you can see the uh, even captures, intentional captures of things like framing, framing Rob Quigley's uh, library we thought were, were important because um, um, Rob's a friend um, <laughs> and a great architect. I mean, um, I'm going to show you Semper Energy for a different reason. This is a building that, um, now we were asked to do the headquarters for Semper Energy, right? They're, they're about a 350,000 square foot user. This is a 16 story building. In this instance, when we're trying to find something authentic, what, we've, what we found ourselves looking at was just the history of the buildings around it. Because this is a historic building right here, right? There's one on the other corner, and there's, one, there's a little uh, fire station on the other corner. And we thought, we've got to find a way to stitch ourselves between all of those things and leave them alone. But more importantly, can the building actually uh, sympathetically yield to the idea of these historic Project. So what I want to suggest to you is that when the curtain wall changes in the building right here, so there's one version of curtain wall, here's a different version of curtain wall, it's really to pay homage to these buildings. In other words, the texture of these historic buildings is intended to, to, to have a backdrop that, that actually runs up through the building. It's not by chance that we did it. Um, now, nine out of 10 people in the world will never know it. What they will feel though, perhaps, is that you know, it feels like it's stitched into the site pretty well. They just may not know why. Uh, that's okay. Um, so then what happens, and you can see right here, see, this, see that shape right there? Right there, that's the same shape right there, right? So that curtain wall yields to a finer grain curtain wall that's all about paying homage uh, to that beautiful little fire station right there. And then as a pedestrian, we basically lift, we lift all that reflective stuff off the ground so that when you interface with the building, it's completely transparent experience. That happens to be their cafeteria right there. Main entry is right there. And main entry actually has a volume that comes out and creates another scale version of entry. That's what its purpose is. It happens to be a special space there. But you can see here, again, the historic building and the yield uh, here, it's really more about that in this case than it is this one, but, but it was intended to address both. Um, this is a little more obvious on this side, these historic shots. Um, and then this is a, really a, a shot that would be taken from uh, Diamond Butte Tower, which is right, right next door. These are balconies uh, for the 15th and 16th floor um, that are just awesome. They look out into the ballpark and, and um, yeah, I wish I was smart enough to be a Semper executive, but I'm not. So, so, so there's this idea of scale, this, this, this idea of, of if you, this is scaleless. Is that, do you understand what I mean by that? It, it, this is like a sheer wall. It doesn't, it doesn't really have any demarcation. It's not like a brick, right? This is the difference between bricks and, and a flat concrete wall as a kind of a, kind of a comparison. And so the idea is to get this thing to, to feel as fine grain as you can at grade so that the human experience against it feels, um, feels more comfortable. And this is the place where we said, let's bring scale down because this is the entry to the building uh, and allow people to, uh, to know that that's the place they, they get in. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the street elevation. And then a shot from the ballpark. 
Um, some some quick shots here. I won't take you through all these. I, I didn't. I think I too many slides. So so um, this this is the project that I want to. This is the probably our next uh, project that that is about to uh, is about to take off downtown San Diego. This is at Seventh and Market Street. This was the design competition with Civic San Diego, and. Uh, this building has 10 separate uses in it stacked vertically um, on 55,000 square feet of, of uh, the 60,000 foot block. Um, what happens is, um, I show you this diagram because to me, if, if, if a building is really trying to be expressive of its user groups, you, you should largely be able to find the user group in the, in the assembly of architecture, in its, in its massing, in its presentation. So these blocks are really shown because they really display the blocks of use that the building is intended to represent as different use groups. If you, does that make any sense to you? In other words, rather than building, and I use a lump of cheese a lot, so I apologize, but. Rather than building a lump of cheese and then me having to discern where residential is from hotel, from office, wouldn't it be better? Because by the way, all of those things have different criteria associated with them, all of them. Window openings are different. Uh, exiting is different in some cases. Uh, vertical circulation is different. Floor to floor heights different. A base spacing for structure is different in all of those uses. Why would they all be in the same housing? They can't be efficient if they are because you've had to compromise one thing for another if you put everything into the same envelope criteria. So this building is built to maximize, that building right there has a different structural grid than that one right there. This is all largely residential, so it has the same structural grid. This is all office, completely different structural grid in terms of base spacing and how wide and deep and high things ought to be. So they ought to live in different places. That's why the building has a sort of an articulated expression to it. It isn't by chance, it's because functionally it makes the most sense. And from an honesty point of view, we're simply trying to be honest about what's inside it. That's the reason, that's the reason for it. Um, so it's got office, hotel, residential in, in three forms, condos, which are up here, uh, market rate residential, which is right here, and affordable housing, which is right here. And then it's got retail around the entire ground floor. This is uh, going to be a revitalized um, uh, African-American hotel. Uh, the, historic. historic hotel, and I can't remember the name of it. It's not Churchill. Claremont. 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 You should be on my team. You're hired. So, so Claremont Hotel, we're going to restore it as part of the, part of the process. Uh, there is then a civic park that occurs right over here that faces Sempra, which is right across the street, by the way, the one I just showed you. Uh, so those two, those two parks will sort of talk to each other across the street with a cafe in this, this facility. Uh, this is the office component right here. Um, uh, and uh, there's a Whole Foods in it um, uh, that, that will also exist on the corner of 8th and Market uh, Street, uh, which is on the far corner over there beyond uh, this, this, uh, this particular photograph. Are things jetting out from this out? I'm sorry? Are things jetting out from this out? That's the hotel. This is the hotel lobby, actually, right there. <laughs> and, and the lobby uh, uh, spills out onto a deck. All these decks are green decks, by the way. All of them are usable. And they all look south toward Coronado, uh, Coronado Bridge and the ballpark uh, with unobstructed views. So, um, you know, this is a 39-story building, so it's 500 feet in the air, which is the highest, by the way, we can build downtown because of the airport. That's a restrict, that's one of the, that's not a PDO restriction, it's an FAA restriction. So um, that's part of it. So these are just some shots that give you an idea. This is that park. Uh, here's Sempra over here, the one we just looked at. There's a park on the north side of Sempra. That's the communicating park on the southeast corner of the new building that we're doing because this is the office tower right there. Um, um, uh, yes, Julia. Um, do you envision any difficulties with the, all the different kinds of hotel use versus condo versus low income versus the retail? Because I know at the beach years ago, one of those things was part vacation rental and part condo and part rental and never between some weeks they didn't get along. 
Well, never the twain does. Well, never the twain does meet. In other words, they, they never see each other. Okay. You can't get in an elevator with a condo user if you're an apartment user, and you can't get into an elevator with an office user if you're a hotel user. Okay. That's actually the complication of, of these kinds of projects is when you build vertically, <laughs> each vertical use has to have its own vertical circulation system because they have to live in isolation from one another, so uh, both for convenience. Hotel people don't, don't intermingle with the no. The decks, that, the decks that are used are hotel exclusive or they're apartment exclusive. Yeah. And never the twain shall meet. It's a good question because it's, it's, one, of the gr it's one of the real challenges, frankly, of, yeah. of a mixed-use project like this. Yeah. Especially, this is a Ritz-Carlton, so it's a five-star five hotel and you've got affordable housing in the project, right? So it's, <laughs> now, it, to be clear, they're on the opposite sides of the building. But, but in fairness, affordable housing sometimes comes with a... Uh, it comes with an unfair sort of bias, I think, in our heads because we hear affordable and think it's bad housing. You will not be able to tell the difference between it and a market rate unit. It's just that they are apportioned to the marketplace with a value system that allows for easier rent structure. That's all. They, they look exactly the same as the other units. Um, um, uh, and that's all I know. So. Um, <laughs> So I want to show you one thing, because uh, Nathan was kind enough to do this. I want to show you the chapel, which is a, just a video, and it's a lot more interesting than me talking, so um, if I don't goof this up, thank God he's here. I don't know what I did. I've already messed it up. This is the new uh, prayer chapel uh, for Point Loma Nazarene University. This is a 550-square-foot building. <laughs> It's maybe the smallest project I've ever worked on. <laughs> and my partners say, yeah, and it's the most expensive project you've ever worked on. Um, I spent endless hours. I'm sorry? That's an actual photo? This is, a, this is a, well, it looks exactly like this, but this is the, oh, this is actually interesting. This is a BIM model, uh, building information modeling. You've heard, maybe you've heard that, maybe you have. This is a three-dimensional model of the actual drawings that were used to build the building, except we rendered the drawings so that you could see this. So, and then we put it into a video. So I'm gonna take you on a tour of this whole building. Um, and it's a little long, so I'll cut it off, but, and then we can take questions if you have them. But what I wanna say about this building is, um, even looking at this diagram, what I would suggest to you is that the site that we were given, um, again, this is a tiny building. The site that we were given was this area right here, um, that's it. This is a building we designed for, for them uh, about four years ago. It's a science building. By the way, the science building here, this is for rain because these are outdoor corridors, so I don't want any criticism about putting an overhang on the north side. So don't try that on me. So, so these, are, these are exterior corridors, so we have the roof for, for protection, not for sun. But, but, but there's, this is all north light, by the way, into that building, which is really key. When you go out there, you'll see everything that faces north is glass. Everything that faces south is protected. That's the biggest part of that building. I would urge you to go see it, not for me. Go see it so that you see how you should respond, I think, to an environmental condition. Um, uh, this building, however, was a replacement for a chapel that used to sit right here. It was made out of wood, and the termites just gave up and quit holding hands. So they said, we've got to tear it down. And they asked me to design a new chapel for them, and I said I would do it as long as I had artistic license, meaning I, I want to do it right, and it's got to be permanent, and it's got to feel like it's going to last for a long time. This is an all-concrete, poured-in-concrete building. Um, it's based on the, the power of three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This is a, this is a Christian university. Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So everything about this building has come from the idea of the Trinity being the, the, the powerful uh, 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 threesome, let's call it, of the religious uh, 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 philosophy of Christian faith. So you'll see there are three slots there. There are three outdoor prayer niches here. There are three um, uh, uh, prayer benches inside. Um, and in this case, what we did is we said, you know, typically, in, as I've seen um, Christian churches, the cross is always seemingly put on a wall. I mean, it's, it's generally speaking, it's attached to a wall. I think it's for convenience. It makes sense, you know, get it out of the way sort of thing. But it's still there as a marker 
for the Christian religion. In this case, it felt to me the, 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 the crucifix was a three-dimensional event, right? It was on a hill. It was a cross put in a hill with two crosses beside it, right? And it was the tallest of the three, and Christ was on that cross. But the idea was you could walk around that crucifix, and you experienced that event, I can only imagine, three-dimensionally, not two-dimensionally. So the idea in this chapel was to pull the cross into the space and put it in the middle and allow people to walk around it. So I give you that preface because otherwise it may not make any, may not, may not make any sense. Um, what am I supposed to do again, Nathan? Mm -hmm. Hit the enter? Oh, space, okay. All right, so bear with me. Here's a tour. Um, this is an olive tree right here with stone benches that sit around it that look out into a beautiful uh, ocean view. Uh, and it's just meant to be a place of solace. Of course, the olive tree symbolic of, uh, of uh, Judea. Um, there are the three, the three niches, all of which have light slots in them to allow light in. There's a window that goes up across the top and down the other side on both sides of the space. Um, it's a slope site, and the idea was just to set the building into that slope site. These are private prayer niches outside. This is stained glass used from the original uh, prayer uh, chapel and reframed and put into a place that is actually radial, radially focused on the cross on the inside of the church. Each of them are focused. So this is the entry. The only color in the building is the purple door, which is a royal purple um, uh, uh, color intentionally. This is core 10 metal right here. The idea is to compress you in the space this way and then to have you come into the volume uh, and feel the volume of the space. Space is only 10 and a half feet wide inside. It's 55 feet long and it's 21 foot high. And there's the cross pulled into the middle of the space. Uh, these are the private prayer benches. The idea of these baffles is that if you come in from the front door, you can't see somebody in there, but if you get to this side, you know somebody's there for safety. Um, these little slots are, are uh, slots intended for people to put prayer requests in, in the concrete. It's, it's, akin, uh, uh, it's akin to the wailing wall, for lack of better terms. Um, and the cross is both a uh, historic wood hickory and then it's clad in stainless steel. Uh, again, this idea of history and uh, modern. This is that, uh, I call it the womb um, or, or the crown of thorns. This is actually, this is actually made from four articulated three-dimensional BIM models that we put together. So there are only four different panels that make up this whole, uh, that whole wall. Um, and again, this idea of three, it's exactly, by the way, 33 feet from the front door to, to the center line of the cross, which was the age of Christ's life. Um, uh, I'm telling you this only because it's where it came from. I'm, it, when we started this thing, I was talking about it's important to have a reason to do something, not to make stuff up, right? And that's what this, that's what this is about for me. It's about finding out about what these people believe and figuring out if you can somehow leverage that into something beautiful uh, as part of, the, part of the process. So all the natural light comes in these windows here, the three of them on the east side, and the skylight that runs across the top on both sides. And you'll see the light moves through the day because sunlight, of course, follows uh, a pattern of, of, um, of time. Um, and if I can, I don't know if I can, a space bar? Um, well, I was going to try to get it to go faster if I could. Um, um, and, and then, and, and uh, of course, the landscape, out, there are a bunch of buildings out here. We didn't model all that. But this is the idea of giving terminus to, and this, this idea of tranquil noise, which is about serenity. It's, a route, it's, it's, a, it's about this idea of getting ready for worship, calming you down with just the idea of water uh, and sort of the tranquil nature of that, and then that's the respite uh, that allows. I just wanted to show the, the can, Nathan, can you actually forward me through so we don't want to take them through all this? Just maybe down in here somewhere. This, I just want to show you light shadows, which we do. There's the site plan. Oh, real quickly. Real quickly, I want to, uh, can we stop that? Yeah. All right, real quickly, this is important because, okay, they asked me to do this building. I get that. That's fine. But this is the site. And it just seems to me no building should ever just be something on a site. It, 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 it ought to be something that's so tied to where it is that it, 
you cannot feel like it doesn't belong there. Now I can tell you, we can't take that diagram to any other site in the world, ever. Can't do it. Because this circle right here is all about that view. It's not just about taking up a nice space in a corner, it's about what it does for the user in preparation for prayer, which is really what that's about. So people come from the main walkway here, they come down through here, they can come to this respite, or they can turn the corner and go into the chapel. Or, if they want to pray outside, these are hedges that are sculpted to create exterior rooms so that if you're sitting, you can't be seen, but if you're standing, you can be for safety reasons, right? But it's simply enough closure that you feel like you have semi-privacy in prayer for yourself. That's what their purpose is. And yes, there are three of them. Um, so it's, it's, it's that sort of thinking that, that we were trying to, I'm just going to show you, these are just some quick light studies that show you what the sun does through a space. Some of them are pretty quick, so hang on. Um, but you can see as the sun passes through the space how it changes in different parts of the day. And these are different times of the year we're looking at this as well. So you can see how the sun rises, moves over, you'll see it come across the top, there you go, and now it's, it's setting in the west. Um, so all of those things are important parts of trying to figure out you know, how a building can become more meaningful than just an abstract architect's idea of what something ought to look like. Um, so I can't tell you what a thrill it's been to be able to talk to you today. Um, thank you. Yeah. <laughs>